Okay, well, I'd like to welcome everyone to another Sunday service of Christ Reformed Church. I'm Pastor Ferguson. It's great to be gathered together in the name of the Lord. Amen. You know, uh, there's a lot going on in the world today. Um, you've heard, or if you haven't heard, I'm sure you have by now, there's a war going on in Ukraine. And uh, that's what I'm going to be speaking about today, this um, crisis that's happening in Ukraine and how um, it is reflective uh, of the scriptures. Um, now you know me, I'm not one of those prophecy preachers that's going to tell you uh, because Russia has invaded Ukraine, this is a sign that Christ is going to return this year or next year or ten years from now. I don't do that because the Bible doesn't say that. And anybody who attempts to say things like that is preaching another gospel. It's not biblical. Uh, but before I, you know, go any further with that, I would like to invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Now let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come unto you in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you and praise you for all that you are, all that you've done, all that you continue to do in our hearts and our lives. Forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all iniquity, creating us clean hearts, renew right minds within us. Uh, Lord, we just um, bring before you the people of Ukraine. And we pray, Lord, your hand of blessing and protection upon them, upon the soldiers, upon the uh, the civilians that are that are fighting to defend their country, uh, God, we just pray you would strengthen them and protect them and bless them and heal those who are wounded. Uh, protect all the little children and women. Uh, Lord, we just pray that you will uh, push back the Russian army from where they came. You would drive them back to to Moscow, uh, where they came from. And Lord, they will not return again. They will not bother this peaceable country of Ukraine. Uh, Lord, they did nothing to provoke uh, Russia from doing this. It's been pure aggression uh, on behalf of uh, Mr. Putin, the president of Russia. Well, we don't know why exactly he's doing this, but we pray that you will repel him uh, and his army. You will send them back where they came from. We know nothing is possible with you, nothing too hard. Uh, Lord, you killed 185,000 uh, people with just one angel has, has that kind of ability to wipe out uh, hundreds of thousands of people. And we pray if necessary you will uh, do this, Lord, you send thy holy angels to defeat this Russian aggression. Uh, Lord, that you will uh, push them back uh, to where they came from. There will be peace in the country of Ukraine once again. We pray for all the refugees who have had to fled, uh, flee their homes, and uh, they're in foreign lands now. Uh, Lord, we just pray that you will bless the surrounding countries to receive them with open arms. Uh, they will have nice, uh, loving, warm homes uh, with food and bedding uh, where they can stay for the time being until this is resolved. Just pray your hand of blessing and protection upon them, a provision upon them. Help the other uh, nations, the EU, uh, the NATO forces, the United States, to get the needed supplies to the uh, Russian military and civilian fighters uh, quickly, Lord. They need help immediately. We just pray your hand of uh, speed and blessing be upon those supplies and weapons. Uh, if they can defend themselves, uh, we just commit this situation unto you, Lord. We pray and ask all these things. Uh, bless all your children and keep us safe and protected. In Christ's name, amen. I need to grab my water before I get started. So the war in Ukraine, uh, you know, I never thought that I would be witnessing this kind of war. Um, you know, 
I was born at the end of the Vietnam War, uh, but I never you know, was old enough to witness that kind of fighting. Uh, you know, uh, there's been other uh, battles, of course, the U.S. has been involved in. There's never been a, a war like this, a war in Europe, a European war. It's always seems to have been against terrorists trying to uh, weed out the terrorists in these other Middle Eastern countries. But this is something uh, unique. It's something that I don't think any of us were anticipating. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of rocked the world. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a wake-up call that evil is still in the world. There are still evil people. Uh, there's always going to be evil people in the world. And uh, we need to be aware of that fact, and that, that's why we have military. That's why we have police to defend the innocent uh, because of uh, wicked people. They just don't care. They, they don't have a regard uh, for human life as we're seeing um, take place in this excuse me, situation uh, between the Russians and the Ukrainian people. So what, what does God, uh, where is God in all this? What, what does God have to say about this? Well, First of all, he says in James that God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So God resists the proud. What does that mean? Well, he's against the proud. Uh, obviously, in this situation, Russia being the aggressor, uh, they are the ones with pride. They're the proud ones. They are thinking they can just walk on somebody else's land and take it. Uh, that's just not acceptable uh, in the sight of God. God didn't tell them to take that land. Uh, you know, all prophecy has, has ended with the close of Scripture. God doesn't speak to people uh, like He did to the children of Israel in the Old Testament. Uh, he doesn't do that. He doesn't speak audibly and verbally uh, any longer. We have His Word. It's complete. So anybody who might say, well, God told me to start this war. That's just a lie. Okay, that, That's completely out of the question. So knowing that God resists the proud, but he, but he gives grace to the humble. And we're seeing that uh, transpire with the Ukrainian people are warding off. Uh, they are withstanding this is supposed to have been a very strong and mighty Russian army, but we're seeing even this much smaller country defend herself. Uh, it's because God is, is with her. God is giving her grace. Uh, they are the humble people, whereas the Russians, the Russian military are the proud people. And God is resisting them. Part of my prayer, and it should be part of yours, that God will continue to cripple uh, that uh, military, that Russian military that is killing innocent civilians and people. Uh, yeah, they have more uh, firepower, but Scripture says it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. Hey, you might have a, a huge arsenal. But if God is against you, guess what? It's going to be of no avail. Uh, in fact, it's going to work. A, it's going to work against you. Okay. So, knowing these things, uh, why don't we take a look at the, the scripture and see what uh, what God has to say about this? Um, I want to turn your our attention first to Matthew and chapter 5. It is the Beatitudes where Jesus preached his sermon on the mount. Uh, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Christ. So Moses, of course, received the Ten Commandments and uh, 
I preached his sermon from Mount Sinai. That's where the law was given. But uh, here, uh, Jesus is preaching uh, law, or Jesus is preaching grace and truth uh, from uh, all of that, uh, the Mount, all of that. Um, or otherwise known as Mount Zion. You know, Mount Zion is the, the uh, in reference to uh, the uh, the Promised Land. The, you know, uh, the Kingdom Land. Mount Zion is is, is where uh, it's where we're going to be. It's where it's where we're at now in a spiritual state. So let's see what the Lord has to say here in regards to. What's going on in between Russia and Ukraine in the world today? And it says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. So he, he took a seat <laughs> and when he was set. Uh, his disciples came unto him. Probably a large rock or something, you know, that he was upon. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, this, once again, is a uh, reference to being humble, uh, poor in spirit, you know, not thinking of yourself uh, more highly than you ought to. Uh, Paul says, In and of me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. So that's being poor in spirit, is having humility. Uh, the man that I will look unto is of a contrite heart and the spirit. That's what the scripture says. Humble yourself uh, and the Lord will, will exalt you. He'll lift you up. Uh, but you have to do your part and humble yourself. Uh, verse 4, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Once again, proud don't mourn, because the, the proud are, have nothing to mourn for. They're full of pride. Uh, it's the humble that mourn. It's the humble that, that are afflicted. You know, we're not wealthy in the things of this world, uh, as the world is wealthy, but we're wealthy in the things of God, and the things of the Word of God, the Spirit of God, and uh, consequently, we're, we're going to mourn because we are afflicted, we're persecuted, uh, physically, spiritually, you know, on all avenues, uh, there's going to be a suffering for the children of God. That's just the way it is. And uh, that's how God is, has ordained it to be. And where sin has come into the world, there's going to be suffering. And, uh, and we're mourning, not, not just because of these things, but we mourn, we should mourn over our own sin. Why do I continue doing these things? That, that should make you sad. Your own sin uh, should make you sad. You should mourn over your own sin because it is it's hindering you. It's keeping you from being that man, that woman of God. Okay? There should be some mourning, there should be grief and, and repentance. As Peter you know, says, he wept bitterly after the Lord he looked over at the Lord and he denied the Lord three times and he looked at the Lord and the Lord looked at him and, and it just made him weep bitterly. You know, it made him mourn because he knew what he had done. He, 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 he could hardly believe what he had done. Uh, and yet he had done it. But uh, he, he showed remorse. You know. Now Judas, on the other hand, after he betrayed the Lord, he, he was not remorseful. Uh, he was convicted, his own conscience was convicted, because he went back to the uh, chief priest that had paid him off, and he says, you know, I've betrayed innocent blood. So at some point it really got to him. He, he realized may, maybe the devil left him, <laughs> you know, after he'd done his work, the devil had moved out of him. Realized the uh, uh, insidiousness of what he had done. Uh, nevertheless, instead of going back to the Lord and asking for forgiveness, he went and hanged himself. You know, that's not the right thing to do. The 
that it is a sign that he never was born again. He never belonged to the Lord. He was a child of perdition. At any rate, let's move on to verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So, you know, here we have being poor in spirit, being mourning, and now being meek. Um, it says that Moses was the meekest man on the face of the earth. So, you know, the word meek does not necessarily mean weak, uh, but it means self-controlled. Okay, it means you're, you're under control, you're meek. Um, you're not boastful, you're not proud, you're not arrogant. You're, you're lowly in spirit, you're meek, you're easy to get along with. You don't snap at people. Even if they snap at you, you don't snap back. You, you stay reserved and controlled. Okay, that's what the word meek uh, really means. And Moses was good at that. Now, he did lose his temper uh, on more than one occasion. You know, he threw the stones down uh, that he brought down from the mount when he saw the people playing and dancing around committing sin. He should never have thrown and broke those stones. God didn't tell him to do that. That was the first incident that he had. And even before that, he killed a man with his, with his hands, you know, back in Egypt. And then he smote the rock. So there's three times that his temper got to him uh, in public. And he did some bad things. Nevertheless, he was considered to be the meekest man on the earth. <laughs> so even though he did have a temper, he was still, for the most part, very meek man, the most meek man on, on the earth. So, you know, David, the great man of God, did wonderful uh, works for God, mighty, mighty man of God. And yet, you know, he, he coveted Uriah's wife, he committed adultery, he had Uriah murdered. Um, you know, he, he had his weak points, and so did Moses, and so do we. But we also have forgiveness with God, and we have the Spirit of God that can keep us meek uh, if we allow Him to. You know, we sometimes we have to put ourselves in check. We need to uh, put a fast on to get our bodies, our tempers, our tongues, uh, our mindset under control. You know, that's what fasting primarily is is for. Is to let the spiritual man overcome the spiritual, the physical man. If you're just constantly uh, feeding the spirit, the physical man, then the spiritual man has a hard time of overcoming the uh, the physical man. You know, the flesh. You have those two natures. The the flesh is all about appetite, physical appetite, uh, coveting, you know, lusting, anger, greed. Resentment, bitterness, uh, hatred, you know, unruliness, uh, drunkenness, disorderliness. That's what the flesh is. It loves those things because uh, all those things are, are sinful. They're against God. But the things of the Spirit, you know, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, meekness, kindness, Faithfulness, self-control, you know, those are the things that the spirit man loves. A clean speech, a clean heart, clean hands, clean eyes, uh, a clean life, you know. In order to tap into those things, uh, you have to resist the impulses of the flesh. Okay? And you got to take on, put on the spiritual man, put on Christ. All right. Um, Verse 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Once again, it's a characteristic. The characteristic of a child of God is that he is constantly hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Okay. Um, they shall be filled. You know, Jesus said, Come unto me, all you weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest take of the waters that I give, buy from me, uh, you know, food that perishes not, and, and drink the, the everlasting waters, the woman of the well, you know, he, Christ met her, and 
She came for physical water, but Christ offered her spiritual water, and she didn't know what he was talking about first, but later she did. You know, she understood that this is a man who told me everything about myself. I, this must be the Messiah. And she received that, that uh, everlasting water, the well that never runs dry, you know, that gives nourishment unto your soul and to your body, because the Spirit heals both. You know, that, that's the blessing of the Spirit. Yes, the Word of God is, is powerful, it's quick and sharp. It, it pierces even down into the physical realm. You know, that, that's just the benefit of the Word of God, of, of the Spirit of God. It, it reaches all areas, physical and spiritual. Um, blessed, verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Okay, so, merciful. What is mercy? Well, mercy is uh, not giving somebody what they deserve. You know, withholding uh, justice, what they what they rightfully deserve. You're holding it back. You're being merciful. And grace, on the other hand, is giving uh, to somebody something they don't deserve. That's being gracious, being giving. And. Um, so that's the, the difference between those two. They shall obtain mercy. So, you know, uh, be a peacemaker. Be gentle. You, you don't don't be, um, you know, always having to exact justice uh, with people. You know, you don't want to do that because that's not being merciful. Okay. And verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The pure in heart. Well, how do you become pure in heart? Well, first of all, you have to become born again uh, to be pure in heart. Okay, if the Holy Spirit is, is the one who cleanses your heart, He purifies your heart, He works out all that filth. Uh, you know, and then, and then your life becomes a living testimony uh, uh, of purity and holiness. Okay, pure in heart, they shall see God. Well, that's. That's the, the end, is to be able to see God. You know, we're going to be able to see God one day, uh, face to face. And sit down and have a meal with God Almighty. Imagine that. Um, and uh, finally, I'm going to stop here in verse 9. I'm not going to go through the whole beatitude. The verse, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Of the peacemakers. Okay, this is where the war is going on. And between Russia and Ukraine. Ukraine doesn't want war, but they're defending themselves. Okay, And then you have peacemakers, you know, the EU, the, the NATO alliance, the United States. You know, we're for peace, not for war. We don't want war, uh, but uh, we want peace. Okay? Russia is obviously not a peacemaker. They're, they're a war maker, a troublemaker, a, a, you know, a killing machine. That's not going to get you favor with God. You know, they're not children of God. Anybody who does that marches on somebody else's country like that is not a child of God. They don't know God. Uh, if they do, if them soldier, any of them soldiers are Christians, shame on them because they shouldn't be doing that. They should leave that army immediately uh, and not do that. They know that's not right. What they're doing is not right. So, uh, now I'd like to turn, while we still have time, to Matthew and 24 and kind of address this, uh, bring this all together, what's going on uh, over there as it relates to the scripture. Uh, and it says in uh, chapter 24 of Matthew, Jesus, it says, he, he went out and departed from the temple and his disciples and came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said, to, Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and, and of the end of the world? Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, 
for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and they shall deceive many. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Uh, seeing that ye be not troubled, see that ye be not troubled, for the, all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, pestilence, earthquakes, and diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Um, and then he, he, you know, of course he goes on. Uh, but I, um, it, it's important to know that in verse 34, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. So what does Jesus say? Well, he's talking to that first generation. He said, there's going to be war. You're going to witness wars. He says this to his disciples. You know, wars and rumors of war. So, you know, this generation shall not pass till all these things be accomplished. So when is Christ, does anything has to happen before Christ comes? No, everything has happened in that first generation. That generation. That's what it says right there in verse 20. This, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. You know, there's a lot of tribulation in verse 21. Then shall be great tribulation, not seen since the beginning of, uh, of the world to this time, nor shall ever be. You know, all these things happen in the first century. That generation, that first century generation, wars, rumors of wars, pestilences, hungers, famines, uh, you know, great tribulations. It all happened then. What are we waiting for? We're just simply waiting for Christ to return again in final judgment in the air. And that's where we're going to be with Him. We're going to be caught up in the air with the Lord and final judgment will take place upon the world. We're, we're going to partake of that judgment. Even of the fallen angels uh, will be judged and sentenced and condemned to the lake of fire forever and ever. So my closing thoughts and words are that don't get caught up in thinking that you know this is some um, event that must take place and, you know, in order or before the Lord comes again. That's not so. Wars have been happening since the time of Christ. They're going to continue happening. You know. But it's our duty. Uh, to pray for uh, these uh, innocent uh, people, the innocent nations. Uh, pray for Ukraine. We pray. We continue to pray for them that God will uh, deliver them uh, from this evil Russian regime. Uh, that has to be our prayer every day and every night until we see a close of this uh, uh, conflict. Okay? So, I just want to thank you for your attention. I'm going to close with a word of prayer, and we'll be through. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you once again for your holy and righteous word. It is your word, and we can trust in it. We believe in it. We thank you for giving it unto us. Uh, we just continue to pray for peace uh, in Ukraine, peace in the Middle East, wherever there is uh, war, wherever there is hatred and malice. We pray for peace. We just thank you and praise you and love you, Father, for watching over us all the days of our lives. We just continue to let this be a peaceful world that we can live in, uh, that your gospel would be proclaimed and people will be saved. In Christ's name, amen.